Would y'all please stand and worship with us?
thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you together as a community. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would bless Professor Broussard as he speaks to us this morning, that you would give us ears and hearts that are ready and attentive to your word. Um, Lord, please bless us this day and allow us to bless others as we go forth in this place. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Covenant College. I'm glad to be here to introduce my colleague, Phil Broussard. The first thing I want to tell you is that his name is Phil with two L's. Not everybody here knows that. Um, it's much more rich and an endowed name than the paltry name of Phil with one L, all right? Uh, second thing is um, he hails from the Cajun, Louisiana, so if you're around him, don't say anything bad about such things as boudin rolls or jambalaya or crayfish soup, all right? Now, f when Phil was growing up, he was probably the quintessential science nerd, uh, maybe the, n the platonic form of a science nerd, I'm not sure. Um, and little did he know that as he was going through his uh, schooling and got a job at the Naval Research Labs that God was preparing him to meet the Lord, Jesus, and pre preparing him to be at a place like this because now Phil has a, a love of physics, he has a, a wonderful, very broad knowledge of all things scientific, and he loves to convey these things with a passion to his students. Uh, he also has many other skills that he puts to use in our department. He is our budget officer, keeps an eye on the money because he spends all the money because he is also the equipment manager. Um, but um, with those things, uh, he also does a fantastic job in the, in the laboratory as well. Now, um, he is married to uh, Dr. Laura Broussard. Many of you who struggle with math know her. Um, <laughs> And they have two sons, Paul, who graduated last year, many of you know him, and Matthew, who can be seen around here nowadays taking classes in mathematics. So that's not all. Last but not least, Dr. Broussard loves Jesus. And I want to introduce my friend and my colleague, Dr. Broussard. Good morning, Covenant College. I'm very thankful to come before you this morning, the chance to present some of my ideas and my thoughts on these uh, series called Dangerous Ideas Professor Green has so graciously set up. As a physicist, I think I'm filled with many dangerous ideas, or at least complicated ones, according to my students. Ideas is the possibility that all 3D reality is actually a 2D representation because of our study of black holes. As a Christian, we're all filled with dangerous ideas. As a speaker yesterday reminded us, original sin, because it attacks the idea that humans can be perfected. What I want to do today is see if I can combine my areas, being a physicist and a Christian, and come up with a different dangerous idea. Now, first I want to acknowledge that the idea for this has come from my discussions in my college physics class with my students. In addition, it's come from reflecting upon my 17 years here at Covenant College, where I've been giving global trends lectures for Dr. Professors Haddad and Corbett on energy and climate change. Um, as I hopefully mature in my walk with Jesus uh, and learn more about the universe that he upholds, I've become more and more convicted of how truly dangerous this idea particularly is. So to get to it, I have to bring up some recent issues and help frame my discussion. I start with a quote from Myron Ebel. Myron Ebel works for the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and he headed President Trump's transition team at the Environmental Protection Agency. In January of this year, he was quoted as saying that the environmental movement is, quote, the greatest threat to freedom and prosperity in the modern world, unquote. Not ISIS, not the national debt, not even fake news. No, the environmental movement. Well, I will come out and acknowledge that I am part of the environmental movement, so I must be a very dangerous person 
if I am part of the greatest threat to freedom and prosperity. And I think that Christians must be very dangerous people too, since I would gather that they are part of the environmental movement, perhaps. When I read my Bible, God seems to really love his creation. We just look at his discussion with Job in Job 38, chapters 38 and 39. Where, go, Job, where God tells Job all the amazing things he has made, and can you do these things? John Piper, pastor and widely read author, has a whole sermon entitled, The Pleasure of God and His Creation. And if we are to love what God loves, I think he would want us to take great delight in all he has made. In particular, God is very angry with those who destroy his creation. So from Revelation 11, verses 16 to 18, and I read from the NIV. And the 24 elders who were seated in their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations are angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Those who destroy the earth are set in opposition to God's people. As a member of this dangerous environmental movement, I am concerned about things like anthropogenic climate change. I, that is, that human caused climate change is uh, due, humans, humans cause cl change in the climate due to our burning of fossil fuels. The preferred term is now climate change rather than global warming because the main issue is the change in climate that is coming. With carbon dioxide levels now above 400 parts per million for the first time in mankind's history, sea levels rising at increasing rates, yes, I am concerned. I am concerned with how climate change is going to impact humanity, especially those who do not have the resources to handle losing their homes, such as Alaskan tribes. Now, I will be happy to discuss with any of you why I believe in anthropogenic climate change, especially when so many Christians seem to not. But climate change is not the dangerous idea I want to talk to you about today. Again, as part of the dreaded environmental movement, I am concerned about other areas, I think, as any follower should be. I'm concerned about the issues of plastic pollution in the ocean, where the food to plastic ratio is now one to seven. Think about that. Could you survive going to the Great Hall if the plastic to food ratio was one to seven you had to consume? The impact of our fossil fuel usage, such as nitrous oxides or coal ash spills. And especially, I'm concerned with how all these issues seem to hit the poor most intently. Again, the suffering that we put upon the poor because of our love of cheap energy and disposable products is, also, is not the dangerous idea I want to present to you but it does lead to it. As I discuss these and other issues with my students in my classes, they will ask me, what impact can they possibly have? Wouldn't any effort of theirs, in light of the size of the problem, be utterly insignificant? And that got me thinking, what if God sees that idea as really dangerous? Our belief that our actions are inconsequential, either positively or negatively, I believe that when we think the harm or the good we do is insignificant, that that, that that is very dangerous. So why do I think this? Now, obviously, you might say that if one person throws some trash in the road, that's not terrible. But if everyone does it, then we have a big problem, granted. And so one small act of kindness may not be so measurable. But if everyone chips in, it can have a huge impact. Just look what we did with moving carbon fluor chlorofluorocarbons to help protect the ozone layer, or boycotting South African businesses to help bring down an apartheid regime, which of course is ancient history for most of y'all. But still, in this mindset, the individual action is again not the point, but the collective power of many. The individual is frankly insignificant. And I say that is dangerous. Why? Well, I ask how Jesus looked at small efforts. Let's look first at the feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 5 to 10. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, 
Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked us only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. Jesus did not look at Andrew and say, sorry, Andrew, that effort is just too small. Thanks, but no thanks. But even more important to me is Jesus' discussion about the widow's might in Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put in and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. I am sure that if I had been there, I would have blurted out, what? How can the creator of all things not handle simple math? What is Jesus saying? He did not say, truly I tell you, this poor woman has given the most loving gift, the most faithful gift, the most honored gift, the most blessed gift, or her reward would be largest. Truly, I tell you, this poor woman has put more into the treasury than all the others. He said it was more. Now, I am no theologian. Perhaps I am missing the entire point. But I strongly believe that the size of our acts of obedient faithfulness are not to be viewed through our Western scientific rational mindset. That only if act of faithful obedience is greater than or equal to minimum faithfulness, it's worthy to God. Or that if my lack, my lack of faithful obedience is greater than some unfaithful minimum, only then is it a problem. Jesus seems to be saying that his way of weighing the scales of faithfulness to his calling is not simply the size of your act. I can't tell you how you should weigh the worthiness of your choices. But when you think it's insignificant, that is just how the disciples thought of the small boy's lunch or the widow's offering, and not how Jesus viewed them. And aren't we, when we're viewing them that way, really accepting that this physical world is all there really is when we see it in those kind of eyes? So when we're thinking that it isn't worth doing something that we know is the right thing because the effort is too small to be effective, a horrible word in those consequences, like putting the aluminum can in the recycle bin, or that it's no problem to toss the aluminum can in the trash because it's just one, I have a feeling that God's economy says that our way of seeing this is totally wrong, and that is dangerous. Dangerous because we're in essence telling Jesus, hey, you are off with having that gift. Can't you count? So I would encourage you not to view acts of faithful obedience to what God is calling you, regardless of how effective they may be, as unworthy of your time or effort. As far as the issues of the environmental movement, that can be working with the student efforts to recycle, and perhaps we faculty can do our part too. Maybe it is saving an aluminum can from the trash that you run across, or perhaps not driving to Walmart this week when something you want can wait till next week. And perhaps even some of you will find yourself involved in that dangerous environmental movement, being a dangerous person working to protect God's creation and to oppose those who destroy the earth. Let me close this in prayer. Father in heaven, 
you who state in Isaiah that the whole earth is full of your glory. Help us to remember that your call to be your stewards over your whole creation is an amazing gift. Help us to remember it's not ours to consume, but to develop it in a way that glorifies you and pleases you. And help us all, as Paul told the Galatians, to continue to remember the poor. I just ask all this in the name of the one who has overcome the world, Jesus. Amen. You are doxology. Close me doxology. Praise God.